Leading Ideas Talks podcast is brought to you by the Lewis Center for Church Leadership of Wesley Theological Seminary in Washington, D.C. Subscribe free to our weekly e-newsletter, Leading Ideas, at churchleadership.com slash leading ideas. Leading Ideas Talks is also brought to you by Sustaining While Disrupting, The Challenge of Congregational Innovation by Douglas Poe and Lovett Weems. This book offers theological insights and practical skills to guide church leaders in stewarding traditions while also seeking innovative opportunities for faith communities. Learn more and order now at churchleadership.com slash books. And remember, to stay up to date with the latest church leadership strategies and information, please like and subscribe to this channel and click the bell icon to get updates for new videos. What's required to bring about meaningful change in your church? F. Douglas Poe Jr. and Lovett H. Weems Jr. maintain that genuine change also involves continuity. In this episode, they outline strategies for sustaining key traditions and systems while simultaneously pursuing new initiatives and innovations. I'm Ann Michael. I'm a senior consultant with the Lewis Center for Church Leadership of Wesley Theological Seminary, and I'm one of the editors of Leading Ideas e-newsletter. I'm pleased today to be the host of this episode of Leading Ideas Talks, and I'm doubly pleased today because I have the opportunity to be in dialogue with two of my Lewis Center colleagues, Dr. F. Douglas Poe, Jr., current director of our center, and Dr. Lovett H. Weems, Jr., founding director of the Lewis Center, now serving as a senior consultant. Doug and uh, Lovett have a new book together, Sustaining While Disrupting the Challenge of Congregational Innovation. And I'm delighted to have the chance to talk with both of you about this subject. Welcome, Doug and Lovett. Thank you. So your book is built around the central premise that genuine change also involves continuity that to successfully bring about meaningful change, a church leader can't focus solely on new innovation and initiatives, but must also attend to sustaining key traditions and systems. Why is this the case, Lovett? Well, the premise of our book is that church leaders have to do two things at once. One is to sustain and one is to disrupt. That is to sustain the ongoing ministries of the church while at the same time innovating into areas required for the future. Now, it's hard for leaders in the religious world or outside to get this combination right. That is, how much do you focus on sustaining and keeping things going and even improving things? And how much do you spend on the new, what's needed for the future and things that you have not done before are things that you don't do well now. Now, often there's a tendency for church leaders to see the past as this part of the church that's not what it used to be and it's not a source of great vitality right now and the future has something different from that past and with that kind of alignment leaders will often personally identify more with the future or with innovation. And so they see these two as almost competing things. On the one hand, they have so many demands on them just to keep people happy with what's going on. But at the same time, they know that they need to be focusing on the future. These have to be seen together, that is past and future, continuity and change. For one thing, virtually all of your assets are 
in the past that is connected to what's going on now. Your people, money, property, credibility. So you don't have the ability just to say, I can ignore what is in order to work on what may be. So it's not that you're trying to innovate in spite of all the demands of the present, but instead you're trying to innovate in light of those assets that you already have. So for example, let's say your congregation is one that has lost its connection to its community. The members no longer live there. People in the church don't know people in the community. People in the community don't know people in the church. There's very little connection day in, day out. And so you're hoping that that can change. So one way to approach it would be to try to minimize uh, your efforts toward keeping everything going and focus on new efforts to engage the community. But as you start looking a little closer at that past this church has, you discover that it's not always been this way, that this church and this community really grew up together. The public school and your church were the first buildings built in the community. When the roof blew off of the school, the school actually met in the church until the repairs were made. Many, many organizations in the community owe their origin to the church. Many of them used to meet in the church. It was a place for public forums and public gatherings. People used to vote there. So now you look to the future, not so much saying we've got to quit being this ingrown church and we've got to become this new community-based church. Instead, you're saying, we're falling in love with our community again. We're going to become what we were from the beginning. So leading change is more evolution than revolution. And you want to build from that past so that you're not saying to people, the future is going to be a church that's not like anything we've been before. Instead, you're wanting to say, we're going to be more of what we've always been. We're going to be more of what God led our forefathers and foremothers to do when this church was started, to commit to this community. And now we're recommitting to that community. Continuity and change must go together, but they take different skills and different efforts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, well, thank you for that, Lovett. It, it really does strike me that you have hit on a on a core truth. You know, this idea that um, we need to uh, incorporate our tradition and our past when thinking about change, and yet um, so many other books, I think, on congregational change focus so much on the new thing. <laughs> you know, that they don't really um, they kind of assume that it's unnecessary, or at least a reader of those books could assume that it's unnecessary or unimportant to also focus on what is. So. So I, I think you're bringing a very important and balanced perspective to this. Um, Doug, I wondered if you could address this from a biblical perspective. Um, are there examples of this approach to change in scripture? We certainly think so. And um, Lovett and I did want to be careful because as you are well aware, you can easily um, make what you are working on or thinking about fit into a certain paradigm. Um, 
trying to avoid that. We do believe in acts, though you find here uh, some examples of how you have to hold these two together of sustaining and innovating. And it um, a lot of acts sort of revolves around this very practical issue of circumcision um, when it comes to the Jews and the Gentiles. But we think the underlying issue is really how do we pursue God's calling, whether we're Jewish or Gentile, right? So how do we sort of really pursue what God is calling us to do as a community, um, whether or not we're Jewish or Gentile? So in Acts, you start off with um, the disciples, of course, um, gathering, and then um, Peter speaks up and um, talks of about what is sort of revealed to him. And you actually have this community in Acts 2. And this is uh, sort of sustaining and embodying what Jesus had built with the disciples, that they were going to take care of those um, in their midst who were struggling, that they were going to continue to live out the scripture, which was for them, of course, the Old Testament. So you have this sustaining community that is embodying what Jesus had sort of delivered to the disciples. Um, and sustaining that work in this community. But then as you continue reading Acts, it is Peter and Cornelius who both have a dream or a vision. And this is where the innovation comes in, that, that Peter envisions Jews and Gentiles together. And today we sort of read this and we understand that it's important, but it's not as probably of a big deal as it would have been to both Peter and Cornelius at that time. This would have been really earth shattering to them to think about these two groups coming together. And Cornelius vision of inviting Peter to come to his house. What is interesting about this is that although it's Peter that actually has the vision, the innovation really doesn't get legs until Paul, who of course was Saul before this, sort of picks it up and runs with it. So what you have is this sort of outsider, this person who at one point was persecuting um, Christians, who now sees things differently and sees the Gentiles as a partner in God's vision for moving forward. So it's the outsider that helps the innovation to take place. And when you think about this, it's hard for us as insiders to often to embody something completely new. So in Acts, we have Peter who is brilliant at sustaining um, sort of what the disciples have learned and doing this very well as we read in Acts 2. But it takes Paul, an outsider, to really think about how can this move in a different direction? And Paul's the one that helps us to connect to the Gentiles and to take what is happening in a different direction. And he does so with a huge risk. He's saying, hey, the Gentiles don't have to be circumcised, right? They can be truly embodying what God is calling and be faithful without being circumcised. So, so in Acts, you sort of have, you know, this tension that Lovett described of how you can sustain and embody community, which is critically important, but also at the same time, there are ways in which innovation are critical and can take place, but it often involves someone with a different perspective coming from the outside, and it also often involves taking risk um, that can be very challenging, um, particularly for congregations that often like to play it safe. Yeah, well, thank you for sharing that example. I, I've always felt that the book of Acts is a great case study in spirit-led adaptive change. And, and, and so I think it's wonderful that you've brought that to the surface. Um, you know, it, it strikes me that, well, this idea of sustaining and, and um, disrupting at the same time is vitally important. I think it's also um, doubly challenging for a leader to need to do those two things at the same time. And so I wanted to shift a little bit to some of the how questions and uh, what are some of the practices of perspectives that a leader can use to balance these two seemingly contrary leadership tasks. And so, Doug, if I could uh, turn to you first, um, in part of the book, you talk about what some of the essentials are on the sustaining side of the equation. And I wondered if you could just um, speak to some of those. Yeah, let me just highlight a couple. And I mean, as pastors, 
it is really critically important that we help others to live into the vision and mission of the church, that, that we help um, those who have been a part of the church for 50 years and those who just joined the church last week to live into the mission and vision of the church. And a key component or a key piece of doing this is we're helping individuals grow in their relationship with God. Um, this means that we have to have vital worship so that they can grow in the way that they love God. We have to have vital ministries where they are able to connect with their neighbors and to live out um, loving their neighbor and express um, that piece of um, what it means to participate in God's vision. So leaders and congregations play a critical role in making sure that worship is vital, ministries are vital, and that they are giving opportunities for those in the congregation, regardless of where they are in their journey, um, to really grow in their relationship with God. When you ignore this, um, just to try new things, then, then you're not sustaining sort of um, what Lovett talked about earlier, those um, key foundational pieces that have helped the church to get where it is today. Another piece of this, of course, is pastoral care. Um, pastoral care is also critical for a church leader, taking care of the flock, taking a journey with folk as they're dealing with life's challenges um, is really important. You can't overlook this in terms of sustaining the congregation. So helping the congregation to, to really know that you are walking with them um, as they face these different challenges in life is how a leader can sustain a congregation. If a leader simply ignores these things, um, while they might be brilliant at creating new things, it's going to still be a challenge for them because the church is not going to be truly living out its vision or mission that it's been called to do. Another skill set uh, that you emphasize in the book, Love It, is um, the so that formula, which again is something that people who are familiar with the Lewis Center's work, something they may have heard of in the past. Um, but you talk about how these two little words, so that, can be so important to leadership and change. So can you, uh, can you talk about that a bit? Yes, the, the church tends to focus a great deal on intentions and activities. The Bible talks about more about fruitfulness. What is the harvest God is calling us to reap? The phrase, so that is one that Tom Berlin and I developed in our book, Bearing Fruit, in which we call it the two most important words for fruitful leadership. The classic example of why it's so needed is Vacation Bible School. It's one of the most common activities that churches of many different sizes, traditions, locations have every year. And it's virtually impossible to find, even in the most active and vital congregations, anyone that can complete the sentence. Each year we have vacation Bible school so that, at least to complete it in a way so that the so that refers not to activities, but what we hope God will do in the lives of the children, their parents, and our community because of it. But you see, unless you're clear on what that end goal is, you don't know what teachers to recruit. You don't know what literature to use. You may not even know whether it should be in the daytime or at night, or if it should be free or can, you can charge a fee. The so that determines everything else. But that's the way we handle so many things. The question is not, is our vacation Bible school achieving 
what God called us to do with that, but rather, did we have it? And so we treat things the same way. So take worship. We think of worship in terms of the activities and we do those well. But have we ever said, our church has worship so that? What do we expect will be different because we do worship? One year from now, if we do worship well, how will the lives of our members be different? How will our community be different one year from now? Once you've identified that, you can say, we have a choir so that. Well, it's not about music apart from the so that or the purpose of our, our worship. Yeah, it, it, it's always seemed to me that this idea of so that is another way of saying we need to clear, be clear about why we're doing something. You know, I, I sometimes talk about the importance of why, and that that's always pointing back to you know how do our activities and actions relate to the church's ultimate mission? Because I think in so many areas, as in some of the examples that you've given, the church has forgotten why it does what it does, <laughs> and you know just thinks that think the thinks that it needs to be about doing what it's was done and, and so I think this so that idea is such a simple but powerful way of keeping uh, ch churches focused on on um, on the importance of why so um, thank you for that so um, at another point in the book um, you suggest um, four criteria for discerning what a congregation's next faithful steps might be uh, and I think that's such an, you know, there's so much in that because this idea of what are your next faithful steps is, is significant in and of itself. Um, Doug, I wondered if you could speak to that. I'd be happy to. Let me uh, begin by saying we haven't talked as much about this piece of it, but um, the book, as you know, and along with um, helping people think about sustaining, which we think is sort of what we're really adding to the conversation. Mm -hmm. But we do also really talk about what does it mean to innovate? Um, and so in taking the next faithful step, we're really trying to help leaders think about um, the balance between those two. So how do mm -hmm. you um, take the next faithful step in terms of sustaining, but also what are some things you can think about uh, next faithful step in terms of innovation? So. Having said that, the first thing that we sort of talk about is um, potential. Um, so how do we determine the potential for something we want to either sustain or how do we put, determine the potential for something that we may want to innovate? And that means we have to evaluate um, sort of the priorities of the congregation. We have to evaluate our mission and what it is that we're trying to do. Sometimes in a congregation, we'll make statements like, we want to reach young families. That's that's the priority of the congregation. Um, and, you know, we'll be disappointed that young families are not um, a major part of our congregation. So what needs to happen often is we got to really sort of figure out um, what is happening in our congregation. And one way to sort of... Um, get at this issue is to sort of figure out what are the rhythms of the congregation? What are the things that are occurring in our congregation as we're thinking about potential? And again, sometimes an outsider can help us see this easier. So inviting someone who's not connected to the congregation to come to worship, to come to a business meeting, to come to some of the Sunday school classes or ministry, just to observe and see what's going on. And let's say one of these people show up at worship, and what they notice is that when a child in the congregation uh, makes a noise or moves, people start staring or people start whispering quietly. Um, so it makes the family feel uncomfortable. So while the congregation says we want to reach young families, uh, the potential to do so is diminished by the very rhythms of how they actually live out their life and worship together. Um, so really sort of um, trying to figure out our rhythms helps us to figure out the potential for what it is that we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. Then when you think about reach, you know, reach 
helps us to not only think about who it is we're saying we want to reach, but what actually will help us to make that happen. So again, if we're trying to reach young families, then we really need to study our community. We need to know, are there schools close by in the community where people or young children are going? Um, are there other places where children are playing outside um, or activities where we actually see children in our community? Um, just to make a statement, we want to reach children, um, but we haven't actually studied our community or studied what has taken place, again, could set us up for failure. So it makes sense to actually figure out what do we need to do to actually reach those that we are seeking to uh, connect with. Um, and actually, as Lovett says, to actually sort of um, start with the question, what do we need to learn? So what we need to learn is, are they in our community? What are they doing in our community? Um, so that we have the actual potential to make this happen. The third one for me, I think, is what is critically important, and that's readiness. Um, so many times we, we um, have the potential to do something. We actually have studied the community, so we know that the children are there because there's an elementary school a block away from us. But are we actually ready for them to be a part of our congregation? Um, this readiness question is key because, uh, again, if Many people in our congregation say, well, we really would prefer the children go to children's church. We don't want them in a worship service. We may not be ready to welcome families um, into our community. We may have to do some internal work to talk about if we're saying families are a priority, then we're going to have to think about what that really means in terms of how we are going to connect with them. And if we are committed to saying we want children in children's church, then we may not be the family community that we think we are. So, so readiness is something that I think congregations skip over too often in terms of taking the next faithful step. And finally, Anne is fit. Um, once you're ready, is it really a good fit for them to be in our congregation? Are we willing to make space um, for them to be a part of who we are. Um, here, just sort of switching the analogy is in this new world of where we're using hybrid, are we simply letting people look at the worship service that we are doing and we don't change anything? Or are we willing to actually change something so that they can have an experience where they feel like they're a part of it? So are we willing to let them fit into what it is that we're trying to do. So potential, reach, readiness, and fit help us to take the next faithful step, whether we're trying to sustain or whether we're trying to innovate. I wondered whether um, you have suggestions for how to order and discipline a congregation's decision-making so that <laughs> all of these different considerations that you have brought to the table uh, can can be implemented uh, within a congregation's actual day-to-day decision-making. Leaders really need to do a, start with a self-evaluation. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes, we sort of naturally are better at sustaining or we're naturally mm -hmm. better at sort of that really creative edge of trying to push the envelope. And both of these are needed, as we suggest, but knowing sort of your own strengths um, and even what you prefer then can help you to sort of um, build capacity in the other area um, mm -hmm. for what you need to do to help the congregation to move forward. Because I, I think sometimes we think that um, one person can do everything. And as we all know, that's not possible. The key is really understanding your strengths and then mm -hmm. having others around you who might be able to help you to build capacity in those places where you're not as strong. So um, having a leader to do that first, and they can do that, of course, um, through discernment on their own. But I also think other people around them certainly can be helpful in this case. Other people will sort of recognize um, naturally some of the gifts a leader will have in one of those places. So recognizing that and knowing that so that you know where you need to build capacity, I think is a place to start. Then um, the next thing that I would say is 
I also then think, think about starting smaller. I think yeah. oftentimes we, we want to sort of move from A to at least M, you know, <laughs> skipping over all the other letters of the alphabet. And, and sometimes what you just need to do is go from A to B, right? Yeah. It, you just need to take, as uh, we talked about, and love it, we'll say that next faithful step. You don't have to get the M. Right. If you make it the B, you actually have done something that is wonderful. Um, so that would be the second thing that I think is key is just helping leaders help the congregation think you just need to get to be. I think oftentimes, um, and I know I'm guilty of it, as we try to help congregations dream so big that we make it sound like you, you know, you have to become this next great thing. Um, and the reality is, no, you have to be authentic to who you are taking your journey. And that may mean you have to get the B and that that has to be the goal. So I think um, those two things would be what I would add to what Lovett said. Maybe you've already answered this, but I but I like to end um, these podcasts by asking about first steps or how someone might best get started. Uh, and so if a church leader wanted to uh, really uh, take the advice in your book to heart and move forward with an approach to change that that is balancing, uh, sustaining and disrupting, what would be a good a good first step? Um, Doug, why don't we stay with you and, and then I'll let Love It have, have the last word. Absolutely. Well, the first thing, of course, Anne, is they should buy the book. I mean, <laughs> that would be the number one thing that at least you do. I mean, that, so that's the obvious. I, and then I think um, what, what would be really important for a leader is to really um, think about it, and Love It has talked about this well today to really think about um, what it is that they need to learn in terms of where it is that they're trying to help the congregation to move. Because I think oftentimes, again, that we, we go to um, workshops or we hear um, people talk and we get great ideas and then we just sort of get gung ho. Um, but what we really need to think about is what do we need to learn if our goal is to start a second service? What do we need to learn if our goal is to reach young families in the community? So, so really um, starting with what do we need to learn about whatever the idea is, is really, I think, the first step. Um, it can feel like you're not doing anything when you're taking that first step, but that learning is really critical, yeah. really going to succeed in moving forward. Yeah, thank you. Love it. How about you? What's what's the what's the good what's the best first step for somebody who's just starting down this road of leadership? Well, I like to say that leaders don't have to have the answers, but they must have the right questions. And a question a leader might start with for himself or herself and also to ask many, many other people who are knowledgeable about the situation is to think five years in the future. Thinking about your church and its vitality, where's your church most vulnerable five years from now? What is it? That is the greatest vulnerability for you. And on the other hand, what is something that if done well, could make your church far more vital five years from now? In other words, what's the big issue? Because the next faithful step works because it's toward mm -hmm. something else. That refurbishing the fellowship hall to make it accessible to the community is not an end in itself, but it's toward that same future of re-engaging the community just as the music ministry beginning a community choir for children is moving toward that way. And so none of the smaller things by themselves 
will reach that preferred future. But many of those things working together. And that's why you're able to get to a point where in looking back, you say, we never could have dreamed that we would be here. But too many of us are focused too much on the present. And without getting the big picture and helping others to get that big picture. And so we're not clear on that vision to which God is most calling us now. Well, thank you for that. So again, the book is Sustaining While Disrupting the Challenge of Congregational Innovation. Uh, and I want to thank both of you both for this conversation, but also for the book. When I heard that you were writing a book on congregational change, I did not envy you the task because I know how many other people have written on this subject. And I was so delighted in reading the book to find that you have offered something that is very novel uh, and very practical. And uh, I think it's going to be a great help to so many people. So thank you for the book. Thank you for all that you do for the Lewis Center and for this wonderful conversation today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us for Leading Ideas Talks. Please like and subscribe to this channel and click the bell icon to get updates for new videos.